Father God, I just thank you for allowing us to come into your presence, allowing us to worship you. And Lord, I pray right now that you do fill this place and allow, and allow us to feel you moving in our hearts. Lord, speak through Pastor Anthony and speak through the words of our songs as we continue to worship you in music. Lord, thank you for this revival and everything that you have taught us through the last few nights. And Lord, I just pray that you will continue to teach us tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'd like to welcome each and every one of you to just tuning in to our revival tonight. And I hope that you have enjoyed the last few nights. If you have not been able to catch the last few nights, go ahead after tonight and tune in to the last, see the last few. This is our first live session, so I hope y'all are enjoying it, and continue worshiping with us as we continue in praise.
Praise your name, Lord, because you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And every knee will bow and say that you are Lord. Lord, we thank you for the technology that binds us together tonight. Lord, we thank you that you saw long ago that we will need these tools to stay in touch with each other, Lord. We just thank you for that blessing that your word is out over the airwaves and in the internet and Lord that it's there for people to see and to hear for the first time maybe that you save Lord I pray tonight that there'll be a peace over our nation a peace that passes all understanding Lord a peace that only you can give Lord I pray that people in this country Lord will realize that we are made in your image 
and that we are so loved by a Savior. And that there's only justice and peace found in you. Lord, help us to bridge the gap between the opposing sides, Lord, and lift you up as the answer. Lord, thank you for your love, and thank you for tonight's service and all the services this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sometimes life seems like words and music that can't quite become a soul. So we cry and sigh, then we try again and wonder what could be wrong. Then we turn to the Lord at the end of ourselves like we've done a time or two before we find his truth is the same as it's always been we never will need more it's not in trying but in trusting not in running but in resting, not in wandering, but in praying, that we find the strength of the Lord. It's not in trying, but in trusting, not in running, but in resting. Not in wandering, but in praying that we find the strength of the Lord. He's all we need for our every need we never need be alone still he'll let us go if we choose to to live life all on our own then the only good that will ever be said of the pain we find ourselves in they are places to gain the wisdom to say i'll never leave him again it's not in trying but in trusting not in running but in resting not in wandering but in praying that we find the strength of the Lord. It's not in trying, but in trusting, not in running, but in resting, not in wandering, but in praying, that we find the strength of find the strength of the
Well, amen. Thank you, brother. Turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. Sunday morning, we looked closely at the testing of Abraham. Abraham, as you know, was a man of extraordinary faith. He believed God, we're told, in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And we said Sunday morning that Abraham was uh, and is a model for saving faith in the Bible. And so we asked the question, what is true faith? The conclusion from our study on Sunday of the text is that true faith is obedient. True faith is active. True faith is not some wishy-washy, namby-pamby faith that just believes something might happen. It's, it's not the type of faith that just is based on something blindly that is not felt by experience. No, it's the type of faith that is based on real experience, a real encounter with God, and a type of faith that is active and bold and obedient. And it's the kind of faith that is put on a God who always keeps his promises. Those who truly believe, who truly trust in the Lord in this way, are naturally obedient to the commands. If you have true saving faith, you want to obey the commands. Now, I'm not suggesting for any moment that we obey every time. I'm not suggesting for any moment that we're always doing exactly what God is calling us to do because no one is perfect. We still dwell in a fleshly world, a sinful world with fleshly bodies that desire the things of the world, and sometimes we give in to this temptation. But what I am saying is that the pattern of obedience in the life of a believer, a true believer, will be one that is faithful to the Lord, obeys the Lord, and is active in their faith. As Abraham models, obedience is not only faithful, it is radical. It's radical obedience. It is a faithfulness that counts all things as obedience, that, that is willing to sacrifice, that is willing to, to go at all costs and do the things that God has called that person to do and do the things in Scripture. And so the Lord tested Abraham by asking him to take his son, his only son, up a mountain. Asking him to take his son and offer him as a sacrifice there as a burnt offering. And Abraham obeyed the Lord. That's kind of where we got to with our story. So what, as Paul Harvey would say, is the rest of the story? What is the rest of the story? Now, some of our young people might be listening in tonight, and they may ask the question, who is Paul Harvey? Ask your parents, and if your parents don't know, ask your grandparents. They certainly know. But what is the rest of the story? Abraham trusted God, but did Abraham have a good reason to trust the Lord? Did Abraham have something to back up his trust in the Lord, a track record uh, of God, uh, of God keeping his promises? Yes, certainly he did. In fact, if you read the book of Genesis, you'll see that God over and over and over and over again fulfilled his promises and kept his promises to Abraham. And Abraham was one that waited on God for years to have this child of promise, this son, this Isaac that God called him to sacrifice. So the question is, if God had called him to go a three days journey away and sacrifice his son on a mountain, how would the Lord provide in this situation? What would the Lord accomplish in relation to his plan in this situation? What type of provision can we expect from the Lord? What, what kind of, uh, of work does God do in our lives when he calls us to do something and we are obedient to do that? What provision does the Lord give us and what can we expect from him in those times? So let's look back at our text again in Genesis chapter 22. We're going to read the, all 14 verses again. So I would ask you to please stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word. And let's read these 14 verses. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, 
And he said, Here I am. And he said, Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. So Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. Then he took, his hand, uh, took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, son. And he said, behold the fire and the wood, but there's no lamb for the burnt offering. And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they were both of them together. When they came to the place which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to, slay, uh, to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to come together and study your word tonight. We thank you, Lord, for this story of Abraham and Isaac that serves as a lesson of what we're called to do as faithful followers of you, as faithful members of the kingdom of God, as people who have been saved and bought with the price and brought into the kingdom. Father, we know we are to follow you with faithfulness and obedience, and, and our faith is to be active and bold, and we're, we're to be committed to you because you are committed to us, and you always keep your promises. And so, Lord, bless the reading and the study of your word tonight as we honor you in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. This evening, we will look at the Lord's provision through the testing of Abraham. So as we look at these verses of Scripture, there are some things that we learn about God's provision in this situation. First, we see this. The Lord always had a plan. From the very first verse in this narrative, we see that God had always planned for this to be a test for Abraham. Look at verse 1 again. And these things God, after these things, God tested Abraham. It was the plan. That's what God was doing. The purpose of the entire story that we just heard tonight was to test Abraham and to show Abraham how strong his faith was and to see the level of obedience. And in hindsight, we know that the Lord would never have asked Abraham to... to plunged the knife into the heart of his son. We know that Abraham would never have required him to burn his son as a burnt offering. We know this. But God did expect Abraham to be willing to sacrifice his son, to be willing to give up even the son that he had waited for so long in his old age, the promised son, and follow God's plan. And so God commanded him to go to the mountain and sacrifice his son as a test of faith, and it was always part of the plan. Now, Sunday, we noted that Abraham was obedient. He immediately got up the next morning. He made preparations. He went on the three-day journey the whole while knowing that God had called him to sacrifice his son. He bound Isaac, laid him on the altar. Uh, we won't get into that, but here's a, here's a 15 or so year old young man being bound up by a hundred and something year old man, and something doesn't compute here. So apparently Isaac was was obedient to his father and did what he asked him to do. And then he even stretched out his hand with the knife in it to, to slay his son. Now Abraham, in the moment when God called him to go and do this, 
He wouldn't have understood this as a test. We have the curtains peeled back to heaven to find out beforehand some advanced knowledge that he was going to test Abraham in this moment. But Abraham didn't really understand it was a test. He just knew his Lord, who had always kept his promises to him, asked him to do something. And he was obedient, and he went and did what God had called him to do because he understood, even though he didn't know what God's plan was, he understood that God had a plan. And this was the purpose, and this was the plan for Abraham's life, and this was all part of who Abraham was going to be. And this was part of the purpose for God's family to see this beautiful act of faithful obedience by Abraham. God always had a plan. Now, theologians are quick to point out, the, they, they say God is not capricious in his actions. It's one of the things that we talk about, we read about in theology. When we look at God's purpose, when we look at God's plans, when we look at God's act, now they say God is not capricious in his plans or his decrees or his purposes or his commands. Capricious means given to sudden and unaccountable changes of mood or behavior. So God doesn't have mood swings. God isn't prone to make a sudden and abrupt change in his behavior. This was the plan from the beginning. God is not reacting to what we do. He has a plan from the beginning, and he knows every outcome of the plan. And so we understand that he is measured and purposeful in everything that he does. And his plans are perfected and controlled. And he certainly will accomplish everything that he sets out to do. So God is not capricious in his actions. I like what R.C. Sproul always said. He said, words have meaning. And we need to understand what words mean whenever we describe God, whenever we describe God's character, whenever we talk about God and teach about God to others. And we need to use words that describe who God is so that we can gain a better understanding of who he is. Words have meaning. I'm not, I hesitate to bring this up because I know probably some of you out there are going to go, <gasps> uh, but I'm not a big fan of the Corey Asbury song, Reckless Love. The very first time I heard it, I was riding in my vehicle, and I heard the song, and I thought, what? That doesn't even make sense. That's not who God is. Here's what the words to the chorus say. And by the way, there's just one word in that whole song that I disagree with. So I really like the idea of the song and what Corey is trying to say, but I just think he needed a theologian to tap him on the shoulder and say, hey, that's not right. It says this, Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down flights till I'm found, leaves the 99, I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Reckless and if you haven't looked this word up in a while, but, uh, but it's the same word that we use for reckless driving, right? Reckless means without thought or care about the consequences of an action. Without thought or care of the consequences of an action. So if that is the definition of the word reckless, then what we're saying is God doesn't care about his, his consequences of the acts that he does. And here's what I'm going to tell you. God only acts in this world because of the consequences of his actions. That is the purpose of his actions. So his actions are never reckless. His actions are purposeful. His actions are prudent. His actions are controlled. His actions are understanding about the outcome of his actions. And so it would be better if the song would have used the word the never-ending perfect love of God or the never-ending prudent word of God, uh, love of God, but that wouldn't be too catchy. I caution you as you're using words to describe God or, or even listening to songs, understand what words mean and understand what they're saying. This is not our God at all. Our God 
is willing to, to, to die for our sins, and every consequence is thought out in perfect detail. And he is not acting without regard to the consequences. He's acting to accomplish the consequences. And so he takes account every aspect of potential events and actual events. And God is always working to accomplish his purpose in this world and in this, in your life. And so I would just say to you that all the songs that we sing in this church are theologically sound. And if we find a song that we like and perhaps we want to use, we'll just change the words. How about that? But we need to be, uh, we need to be thoughtful about what we sing and what we say, and I'm grateful that, we, that Pastor Bobby sings songs that are theologically accurate. That's what's important. Our words have meaning. And so if you ever come up and say, hey, would y'all do that song, Reckless Love, in church? The answer will be a resounding no. I don't try to control too much, but that's one we can't do. The Lord always had a plan. He's not capricious in his plan. He's purposeful, and he accomplishes his will. Secondly, Abraham trusted in the Lord's plan. Abraham trusted in the Lord's plan. Look at verse 6. How do we know Abraham trusted in the Lord? Well, Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took the hand and the fire, uh, in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them, and Isaac said to his father, My father, he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So they both of them, uh, they went both of them together. Further evidence that Abraham trusted God was his conversation with Isaac on the way up the mountain. This, no doubt, was a trying time for Abraham and his son as they walked to the place that the Lord has commanded. And Isaac was an intuitive young man. He was understanding that something was going on here, that they had all the stuff they needed except for the lamb, and he wondered where they were going, uh, why they were going to sacrifice with no sacrifice and, and no uh, ability to find one. And no doubt, Isaac had been with his father before. No doubt, they had taken a sacrifice somewhere and sacrificed it, and they had taken the sacrifice with them. But the most convincing verse of, is verse 8 of Abraham's faith was that he told his son, the Lord will provide. The Lord will provide a lamb for the sacrifice. It's unclear what Abraham thought would happen. Did Abraham think that, that the Lord was going to keep him from sacrificing his son and would provide a ram in the thicket? Did he, did he think that? Did he think that he was going to be required to sacrifice his son and God was going to raise him from the dead? God had already promised this son would be the son of promise. What did he think? We don't know what he was thinking, but we knew he, had faithful, he was faithful to God and knew that God was going to accomplish his plan through this person, Isaac. And regardless of whether he was called to sacrifice him or not, Isaac would live. Isaac was promised a son, and, 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 the, and the Lord uses this term, your only son. He was the only son, the son of promise, his true-born son. And God was asking Abraham to kill him. And Abraham knew that God would somehow, some way, provide a way for this child to be the son of promise. So Abraham trusted the Lord's plan. And then thirdly, we see the Lord provides. In verse 9 to 14, we see the rest of the story that God did, in fact, provide. He stopped Abraham from killing his son. He intervened in his life and showed him a different way. You ever had the Lord intervene in your life and show you a different way? You ever had the Lord put the brakes on your plans and show you a different plan? Uh, I've had that happen a number of times. Uh, I like to go my own way sometimes, and the Lord gets my attention, I'll put it like that, and directs me to his path. So he stopped Abraham, and he intervened, and he showed him a different way. You may be going through some kind of test right now from God in your life. God does test us. God disciplines us, but he also tests us. He puts us in places where our faithfulness can shine through. 
I've seen people who have been uh, diagnosed with cancer and going through various treatments and, and, and maybe going to remission only to be diagnosed again. And then these people were people of faith, people that glorified God, people that lifted up God through all that, and other people were impacted by their faithfulness in the midst of that test. Perhaps you've been obedient to the Lord, but maybe what he's asking you to do doesn't make sense. Maybe it seems illogical. For example, if God were to ask you to sacrifice your child, well, that doesn't make sense. Lord, you want me to do what? Lord, you want me to move to Georgia Bulldog country? <laughs> you want me to leave my kids behind and come and pastor a church? Lord, why me? He asks us to do things that sometimes don't make a lot of sense. And I, don't, I, I know there's a lot of reasons God probably bought, brought me here. Maybe it was to teach you guys some Roll Tide. I don't know. But maybe it was just to teach you guys some Bible. And the Lord had gifted me with the opportunity to do that. But I want you to know this, that where God guides, God provides, right? Where God leads you, he will get you through to the other side. If he leads you up a mountain to slay your Isaac, you must be willing. Many times we, we are unwilling to follow God in the places that he calls us to go. Maybe he's calling you to the mission field. We've seen some even from our midst that have gone to foreign countries to share the gospel. Maybe he's calling you to just go to your neighbor's house. Maybe he's calling you into the ministry to be a pastor or youth minister. God sometimes calls us to do things that seem illogical. I often said, I'll never preach. God calls us to do things that don't make sense. And Dr. Spock may advise you against doing that thing that's illogical, but God is bigger than you and me, and he's bigger than Mr. Spock. And God, when he guides you somewhere, he understands the bigger picture. In fact, he's in control of the bigger picture, and he is operating according to his purposeful and perfect plan to accomplish his will in your life. And so where he guides you, he will lead you from start to to finish and he will provide for you in the midst of that so we must be willing to understand that the God of the universe is providing all the tools that are necessary for us to accomplish what he's calling us to do in this life and we must understand that he will provide he will do it and and, and he provided the the sacrifice for Abraham by the way notice the sacrifice was still necessary even though he didn't call him to sacrifice his son Isaac, the sacrifice was still necessary. And the Lord provided a ram in the thicket for them to, to offer as the burnt offering. And so God not only saves us, but he guides us, and then he gives us the ability to obey that which he guides us to do. You say, I don't have the strength to obey on my own. Well, that's the point. That's the point. God gets us to a place where we can only trust him to do what he's calling us to do and where he provides for us when we do what he's calling us to do. And so, as we've been moving on Wednesday nights through the books of the Bible, one of the things we've been doing is not only looking at what the book is teaching to those that would have read it and understood it. But we've kind of been zooming out and see where that book fits in the scope of redemptive history. For example, what does this book say about Jesus? And so tonight, we need to look at what this passage says about Jesus. We, we see the foreshadowing of the one and only son that would be required for sacrifice. We see the ultimate provision of God. So lastly, let's look at God's ultimate provision. We've already noted that even though God spared Isaac, a sacrifice was still required. But that ram didn't atone for any sins in the life of Abraham or Isaac. That life, uh, that, that lamb was only a foreshadowing of the one that would die for them that would provide a forgiveness of sin and the penalty of sin. 
We notice this, that Hebrews 9.22 says, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And we also see that the person of Jesus is, is foreshadowed and pointed out in several verses. In verse 2, Abraham called uh, his son only son. And God's son, Jesus, is his only begotten son in John 3.16. In verse 6, we see Isaac carrying the wood up the mountain, very symbolic of Jesus carrying the cross up the hill of Golgotha, all the way up Calvary. This verse points to the cross of Christ. Christ, God's only son, was forced to carry this cross, which was the instrument of his death. Isaac was forced to carry the wood, which would be part of the instrument of his death, had God called Isaac. Abraham to sacrifice his son. The story of Abraham's testing points to the necessity of sacrifice, the necessity of the death of God's only son. Jesus on the cross to reconcile men and women to God to bring them into the kingdom. Why is Jesus' death necessary? Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's not one person that deserves to go to heaven that has ever been born, There's, uh, except Jesus. There's not one person that doesn't deserve to be in hell right now, and there's not one person in heaven that doesn't also deserve to be in hell. We are sinners, and the sacrifice that Jesus provided for us on the cross was the sacrifice that is necessary to save us. It was the sacrifice that was necessary to spare Isaac. And the lamb was slain, but the lamb was the precious son, the only son of God, Jesus Christ. Jesus is God's perfect provision. Sinful men and women stand as enemies of the God of the universe. And the only way that we can be reconciled to God is through the payment for our sin. The gospel is pretty simple. Everyone's a sinner. Everyone deserves the punishment of hell. The wages of sin is death. All of us are sinners. And there is no way that we can save ourselves. There's no way we can be good enough. There's no way we can come to church enough. There's no way we can be kind enough to our neighbors. There's no way we can give enough money to charitable organizations to save ourselves. There's nothing that we can do in this world to save ourselves. The wages of sin is death, and we are destined to go to hell. But God, who is rich in mercy and love, was not content to leave us in this situation. And so he sent his son, his only son, Jesus Christ, who was the perfect God-man. He was perfect in that he never sinned. He was able to do that because he was not born of an earthly father, but he was conceived of the Holy Spirit. And he lived a perfect and sinless life. And so the infinite God of the universe wrapped himself in flesh, became a man. He was a man and he was God. He was 100% man and 100% God. And he was able to perfectly do what no other human being ever did or no other human being will ever be able to do. Please God. God sent him to the earth to die in our place. And Jesus died on the cross was buried and three days later rose again. So he secured victory over our sin by his death on the cross. The penalty was paid, the wages of sin is death, and the wrath of God, the cup of God's wrath was poured on Jesus when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then three days later he rose from the dead, so he conquered sin with his death, and he conquered death with his life when he rose from the dead. Death died when Jesus rose so that we could have life. And the Bible says that the only way for us to be saved is to put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ. There is no other way. Faith is the key to salvation. Not the wishy-washy faith we talked about, but the faithful obedience that's willing to place their full trust in God. That's what God is calling us to do. And so this ultimate provision of God was planned, the Bible says, before the foundation of the world. This perfect plan of God was planned before the world was even created. And then 
While Abraham was sacrificing his son, the plan was already in place. We know God always keeps his promises. We know God always accomplishes his plan. And we know that it is coming. And so Old Testament saints were saved by faith. New Testament saints were saved by faith. Believers today are saved by faith. There's no one who is ever in heaven that is not saved by faith. Faith in what? In what Jesus did. He did what you couldn't do. He lived in a way that you could not live and died your death, and he paid your penalty. He is the ultimate and perfect provision of God slain before the foundation of the world for sinners like you and me. So who can be saved? Only those who call upon the name of the Lord. For whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you're listening to the sound of my voice tonight and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, this is a call to salvation. This is a call to give your life to Christ. And, and you understand where God guides, God provides. If you're a believer listening to my voice tonight, maybe your faith has been weak. Maybe you're going through some testing and some challenges in your life and you don't know exactly what you need to do or exactly how you need to move forward. But you know God's called you to do something, so I encourage you to take a step of faith when God calls you to do it, he's going to give you the courage, he's going to give you the strength, and he's going to give you the provision to go where he's calling you to go. And so, we must trust in God first for salvation and trust in God continually to follow him at all cost. Are you willing to follow God at all cost? Are you willing to be obedient to God at all cost. We must have the faithfulness of Abraham. And we must follow God wherever he leads us because God loves us and he always keeps his promises. Heavenly Father, God of the universe, creator of all things, we come before you tonight thanking you for this Beautiful story in the Bible of faithfulness. And Father, sometimes when we read a story like this, perhaps there is a bit of uneasiness in us that God would even ask this, this patriarch to do this to his precious son. But Father, we must never forget that you yourself sent your son, your only son, to this earth, your precious, wonderful, infinitely perfect, righteous son to be accused as a criminal and crucified on a cruel cross for something he did not do he who knew no sin was made sin on our behalf and God in that moment you demonstrated your love to us and that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us Father, this world is broken. It doesn't take a lot of research or even a lot of intellect to look around and know that this world is broken. People are cruel to one another and hateful to one another and disrespectful to one another. People murder one another, steal from one another, dishonor one another. And they shake their fist up at the sky and they spit at you, oh God. This world is broken. But Father, we know this, that your son Jesus is the only answer to our salvation, the only answer for our broken world. And so, Father, I pray right now, as my dear brother Mike prayed a moment ago, Father, I pray that, that this world will see the light through believers like you and me. That they will see the hope through believers like you and me. That we will bridge the gap between opposing sides and bring them not to each other's side, but to the cross of Jesus Christ. For Father, the answer to the unrest in our country, the answer to racial injustice, the answer to anger in our hearts, it's you. It's your son, Jesus, and it's salvation. Father, we're all one race. 
We're the human race. We're all one people. But Father, we can only live forever in glory with you if we put our faith and trust in Christ. And so, Father, if there's someone listening tonight that does not know Jesus as their Savior, we pray for the convicting power of your Holy Spirit to be all over them. So they will come to you for salvation. And Father, for those of us that believe, oh God, help us to be more faithful. Help us to put our hearts squarely in your court, Lord. Help us to take our steps in the path that you show us. And help us, Lord, to depend on your provision. For it's only through your power, it's only through your grace, and it's only through your will that we can do what you call us to do. Help us, Lord God, to be the church in this time. Encourage us, O oh God. Equip us, O oh God. Help us to come. Come to you, Lord. Come just as we are. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Come just as you are, hear the Spirit call, come just as you the Lord to save you tonight, I would love for you to contact me. Uh, just go to our, our website, uh, find me, and click on my email, and just send me an email, and, and I'll get in contact with you, and share more with you about what it means to be saved, to show you some, uh, some tools that you can use to grow in your faith, and of course, we'd love to see you once we open back up for worship. Uh, if you're at home tonight, and maybe you have not been as faithful as God has called you to be, uh, I pray this is the commitment that you need to make to take the next step in your walk with God. Let us all be the church. Be faithful. I hope you've enjoyed these services. I am so thankful for all those who have come out uh, and recorded these services and, and our live stream tonight. I'm thankful for those that prepared sermons and preached. I, it's been such a great time. And I hope you find some encouragement in all this, and I hope you grow in your faith as a result. Thank you so much for tuning in. Let's close with a chorus. We'll sing Because He Lives. Because